اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم والحمد للہ رب العالمین صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم یا سیدی و یا مولا یا رسول اللہ صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم یا سیدی و یا مولا یا ابا عبداللہ یا رحمت اللہ یا رحمت اللہ الواسع و یا باب نجات الامہ ویا عبرت کل مؤمن و مؤمن یا لیتنا کنا معکم فنفوز فوزا عظیما بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ألف لام را كتاب أنزلناه إليك لتخرج الناس من الظلمات إلى النور من الظلمات إلى النور بإذن ربهم إلى صراط العزيز الحميد صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوات The holy book of Islam, the holy Quran, is a book of guidance, book of enlightenment, book of healing and salvation and liberty. It is incumbent in such a great night. We have an insight about this a great scripture that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent it to entire humanity. In the narrations, the hadith says that خُذْ مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ خُذْ مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ مَا شِئْتَ لِمَا شِئْتَ Take any part from the Holy Qur'an, any place, any ayah, any verse, any chapter, for any reason that you have. If you want to have it for guidance, you can have it for guidance. If you want to have it for healing and curement, you can do that. If you want to solve problems, you can do that. If you want to take it for an entertainment, you can do that. If you want to recite about the past and enlighten yourself about history, you can do that. It multi-purpose book. Therefore, it is incumbent that we shed some light on this great book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The title of my speech tonight is Quran the book of guidance and liberty and we will be explaining you know different parts of it after your big and loud salawat the ayah starts with this it says kitabun anzalnahu ilayk the book that we have revealed to you islam take a great emphasis and is keen to introduce new terminologies through its fundamental principles. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala want to explain an important principle, a fundamental principle in Islam, has brought it in a new terminology and vocabulary that did not exist during the time of Jahiliyyah. It was non-existence, was not available. It's a new words and new vocabularies. For example, the word Quran itself, it is unprecedented. Before the ignorant people, people before Islam were unfamiliar with this word Quran. Or fiqh, yatafaqqahu. Fiqh and jurisprudent, you know, 
did not any, have any meaning before Islam. The word imam, the leadership, didn't have any place in the Jahiliyyah's literature. Also, some common names like Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Ali and Hassan and Hussein alayhim salam. Their names are unprecedented. Those were, they came after the advent of Islam. No, you look at the entire Arab history. You don't find someone who carried the name of the Prophet, peace be upon him, or the name of Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam, or their children. Those are unprecedented. Islam was keen to introduce those. What is the reason? For mainly for two reasons. Number one, because the Jahiliyyah's terms and vocabularies were incapable, simply incapable to explain those fundamental and grandiose you know, vocabularies in Islam. They didn't have that capacity that you find a term that is used in Jahiliyyah to properly address this new term that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is introducing, like the holy book, Quran. There wasn't, basically there wasn't a meaning or a word that can give the desired meaning of, you know, word Quran. This is one reason. And the other one was purposely done by Islam and by the Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make a big separation between Islam and the previous cultures before that there is no ties between them. Make a milestone in differentiation between Islam and its vocabularies and terminologies and the Jahiliyyah. Making two different separate things completely. So people would not think of Jahiliyyah when they mention those new terminologies. Is this clear? So those were the reasons that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has brought those names. The first name of the holy book is Quran. Quran is derived from the word qira'a, meaning reading and recitation. But the more you read and more you recite until it becomes Quran. When you memorize something for due to repeated reading and recitation, you will memorize it by heart and by mind, then it becomes Quran. This is one meaning of the Holy Quran, Holy Book. The other word that in this ayah is used, kitab. Anzalna ilayk al-kitab. Kitabun anzalnahu ilayk. A book. Kitab means a book. But again, it is taken from its root, kitab. Kitab means writing. When you write and write and write, multiplications of writings is called, you know, kitab. Why? Because there are plenty of words you corroborate in defined sentences to give you a coherent meaning in the form. You know, those sentences become pages, multiple pages, until they give you a, com you know, a comprehensive meaning of the idea in the form of book. So there are two things, Quran, multiple readings, and Kitab, multiple writings. You see, brothers and sisters? The holy book of Islam, the Quran, is the eternal miracle of the Prophet, peace be upon him. That is meant to exist from the day of the Prophet until the day of judgment. Any idea, any concept, anything that you wanted to become permanent, you have to document that. How? By reading and by writing. Any idea that you have. If there an event took a place, if you do not corroborate this, Sallu ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. The salawat, the fifth night of Muharram, Shab al-Jum'ah, and so weak, we need a bigger one. The third one, Sallu ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. Therefore, to preserve something, to make it continuous, is that through reading and writing. When you corroborate the idea and you document that idea, it becomes permanent. Therefore, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about two features of Quran. One is the reading, the recitation, 
and the other one is the writings, both of them, combined together to give you the meaning of the Holy Quran. Now, the ayah says, Kitabun anzalnahu ilayk. Multiple meanings for kitab. The first meaning of kitab, the book, meaning, means the holy book, the Quran that we recite here. Every prophet, every messenger, they had books. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala endowed them with some sort of books, some sort of scriptures, documents to guide people. Starting from Nuh alayhi salam and continuing Ibrahim, Musa, Isa, and the Prophet peace be upon him. As the ayah says, إِنَّ هَذَا لَفِ الصُّحُفِ الْأُولَى صُحُفِ إِبْرَاهِيمَ وَمُوسَى In fact, some scholars say that there is no prophet, no messenger without any book, without any sort of scripture. Why? Because the Holy Quran says, it says, كَانَ النَّاسُ أُمَّةً وَاحِدَةً فَبَعَثَ اللَّهُ النَّبِيِّينَ مُبَشِّرِينَ وَمُنْذِرِينَ وَأَنزَلَ مَعَهُمُ الْكِتَابِ God has sent multiples of prophets and messengers and have endowed them with books. So the first meaning when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Kitabun anzalnahu ilayk, the scholars say the meaning is this book. This is the holy scripture that we recite. But there are other meanings of books. The second kind of meaning, the second sort of meaning, it is the book of records. Our archives, brothers and sisters. Have you checked on your credit history? Have you gone and checked your credit history to see how many marks you have? How many violations you have? How many troubles you have? What is your score? This is the same thing. The archives of our records. Whatever you have done, it is, you know, corroborated. It is registered in your book. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَكُلَّ إِنسَانٍ أَلْزَمْنَاهُ طَائِرَهُ فِي عُنُقِهُ Every human being has made, has connect whatever comes from him. طائر means whatever that gets out from him, not a, you know, a flying bird. Here it says that whatever comes from him, we hold him to his neck, meaning that we make him responsible. وَكُلَّ إِنسَانٍ أَلْزَمْنَاهُ طَائِرَهُ فِي عُنِقِهُ وَنُخْرِجُ لَهُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ كِتَابًا يَنْقَاهُ مَنْشُورًا اِقْرَأْ كتابك. On the day of judgment, this book will be opened. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells him, read. This is your record. Whatever you have done, today you have to, you know, see how many sins we have committed, how many lies we have made, how many profane language we have seen, how many, you know, haram look and haram sight we have done, all are written down in this book. Good things and bad things, both are written th there. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about an incident that mujrimin, those criminals who are so terrified when they tell them that the book reading has come. It says, وَتَرَى الْمُجْرِمِينَ وَوُضِعَ الْكِتَابِ The book is coming. The records are coming. You know, the files are all dispatched. وَوُضِعَ الْكِتَابِ فَتَرَى الْمُجْرِمِينَ مُشْفِقِينَ They are all terrified. مِمَّا فِيهِ يَقُولُونَ يَا وَيْلَتَنَا مَا لِهَذَا الْكِتَابِ لَا يُغَادِرُ صَغِيرَةً وَلَا كَبِيرَةً إِلَّا أَحْصَاهَا Has not left out anything. Be it big or small or minute, it has been recorded. Who records this book? Who records this book? There are two angels. مَا يَلْفِضُ مِنْ قَوْلٍ إِلَّا لَدَيْهِ رَقِيبٌ عَتِيدٌ You know, Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam has this beautiful words. اللهم صلى على محمد وعلى محمد In dua, come in like, you know, tonight's dua. It says, وَكُلَّ سَيِّئَةٍ أَمَرْتَ بِإِثْبَاتِهَا الْكِرَامَ الْكَاتِبِينَ الذين وكلتهم بحفظ ما يكون مني وجعلتهم شهودا علي مع جوارحي. You have made those two كرام الكاتبين. كرام الكاتبين. The ayah it says وإن عليكم لحافظين كرام كاتبين يعلمون ما تفعلون. Those two they write down. One of them write the good things. The other one write the bad things. 
This is the record. It's all piled up throughout our life. Now, on the day of judgment, those books are brought. How we are handed. How would they give us the books? If we are part of Ashab al yameen meaning going to the heaven, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the books in our right hand. فَأَمَّا مَنْ أُوْتِيَ كِتَابَهُ بِيَمِينِهِ فَسَوْفَ يُحَاسَبُ حِسَابًا يَسِيرًا وَيَنْقَلِبُ إِلَىٰ أَهْلِهِ مَسْرُورًا May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us among you know, those who get their books in their yameen, Ashab al yameen The one who takes the book, his records, in his yameen, easy accounting, you know, easy interrogation. They will go check him immediately and tell him you go, you passed. But God forbid if he becomes Ashab al-Shimal. It says, وَأَمَّا مَنْ أُوْتِيَ كِتَابَهُ وَرَاءَ ظَهْرِهِ Shimal, with his hand, the left hand, but not like this, not from front, rather from the back. The narrations that his hand will go through his stomach gets out from his back. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give him the book in his left hand. وَأَمَّا مَنْ أُوْتِيَ كِتَابَهُ مِنْ وَرَاءَ ظَهْرِهِ فَيَدْعُوا ثُبُورًا said, may Allah, may I have not been created. May I have been destroyed and not have seen, you know, such moment. This is the moment of loss. You see, brothers and sisters, Ahlul Bayt, alayhim salam they have taught us certain dua, certain prayer, supplications, very small, very beautiful. If you continue on those, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will grant us those books, you know, in our right hands. And that's when, we, when you make wudu. It says that when you make Wudu and you wash your right hand, you say, Allahumma a'tini kitabi biyameeni, wal khulda fil jinan bi shimali, waha sibni hisaban yasira. Very simple and very elegant, very beautiful. When you wash your left hand, says, Allahumma la tu'tini kitabi fi shimali, wala tajalha maglulatan ila unuki. If we continue on this, supplications this beautiful prayers Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most generous he will take you know the harm and the fear of day of qiyamah away from us and we will receive the book in our right hand so this is the second meaning of book the third meaning of book is the book of creation that the almighty God has written everything in that book there isn't anything that is not written in that book. The ayah says, وَعِنْدَهُ مَفَاتِحُ الْغَيْبِ لَا يَعْلَمُهَا إِلَّا هُ وَيَعْلَمُ مَا فِي الْبَرِّ وَالْبَحْرِ وَمَا تَسْقُطُ مِنْ وَرَقَةٍ إِلَّا يَعْلَمُهَا وَلَا حَبَّةٍ فِي ظُلُمَاتِ الْأَرْضِ وَلَا رَطْبٍ وَلَا يَابِسٍ إِلَّا فِي كِتَابٍ مُبِينٍ There is nothing, even a tiny little seed, in the heart of darkness, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala records that one. There is nothing that is a dry or wet that is not written in this a great book. The Almighty call it Kitabun Mubin. Sometimes this book is referred as Kitabun Maknoon. It is well guarded book. Innahu la Quranun Kareem fi Kitabun Maknoon. Then what does it say? لا يمسه إلا المطهرون. This book, the book of a creation. Why God makes it in a book of a creation? Why He makes it in a form of book? Is it for Himself? He doesn't need a book. There must be someone else, some entity reads it and understand it. Who is that entity? Quran explains. It says كتاب إنه لقرآن كريم. في كتاب مكنون لا يمسه إلا المطهرون. Except one group who can reach the comprehensive meaning of that book. Who are those? مطهرون. Who are مطهرون? Who are those who have been cleansed and are immaculate? There is another ayah explains this. It says إنما يريد الله ليذهب عنكم الرجس أهل البيت ويطهركم تطهيرا.
It is Ahlul Bayt. On the day of Kisa, when Hadithul Kisa was, you know, narrated, and the ayah, this ayah was descended, you know, the Prophet was under the cloak. He collected his family under the cloak. Jibra'il, the grand angel, he had no idea who was that. He asked, Ya Allah, who's under the cloak? The answer came. What was the answer? The Prophet, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, didn't tell him it is the Prophet and his progeny. What did he tell him? It says, Hum Fatimata wa abuha wa ba'luha wa banuha. It is Fatima and her father and her sons and her husband. This is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has introduced this family. Sallu ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. So the ayah says, Kitabun anzal nahu ilayk. We have descended to you a book. Why? For what reason? لِتُخْرِجَ النَّاسِ مِنَ الظُّلُمَاتِ إِلَى النُّورِ So you take them away from sheer darkness to light. Basically meaning from ignorance to guidance. From evil state to a good state. This is the meaning. How does Qur'an guide us? What were the forms of guiding that Qur'an has done? There are multiple forms of brothers and sisters. I'm just going to touch upon the three of them. The first one is when this Quran, this holy book liberated us from idol worshipping to worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That was the first form. From paganism, is that what is it called? Paganism? Being pagan to God believing people. This is one way of, you know, liberation. They use to create their own God and they used to pray for the same God. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ridicules this name, notion. Says you are the one who sculpted this God, this Lord. And then you pray for him. You're the one who created. At any time you can destroy it, you can terminate it. And you worship this kind of idol. Is that, does that make any sense? Isn't that a sheer stupidity? What kind of mind is this? What kind of belief is this? In the narrations, it says that those ignorant will find rocks, build rocks, and then they would worship them. All of a sudden, they find a better rock, more expensive rock. They destroy this one, go and build another one. Sometimes, they don't have anything. They make pile of dirt. They bring their goat and milk the goat on top of this pile of dirt. And sometimes if the goat doesn't have milk, you know what, what the goat does. To, you know, to make it all a pile. And then they revolve, make tawaf around, you know, this pile of dirt. Considering this as a god. Sometimes they were, you know, they were farmers in the farmlands, palm trees. They grab the dates and they form an idol with this date. During the day they worship, at night they, they get hungry, they eat their Lord. And when they eat the Lord, what happens afterward? What, what, you know, what, where does it end up? This is their mentality. This is not only an insanity, brothers and sisters. It's not only a mindless being. In fact, they lose their self-respect. They lose their dignity. Someone who bows for rock and for dirt and for date, he will bow for everything. He will be humiliated by everything. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Holy Quran, says that you were fearing everything. تَخَافُونَ أَنْ يَتَخَطَّفَكُمُ النَّاسُ مِنْ حَوْلِكُمْ You know, at any moment, you were afraid that people will come and rob you and take you away. Why? Because they lived in a humility. Someone who worship an idol should not be expected better than this. But Quran came and transformed them. You all know the story when the Muslimin went to Habasha with the guidance and leadership of Ja'far al-Tayyar alayhi salam. They went to Habasha and they entered upon their king Everybody, the priests, the officials, the delegates, all bowed for the, you know, for the Najashi, for their king. 
prostrated for him, except the Muslims. The Najashi told them, why didn't you do that? They said, we don't do this except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even for our Prophet Ja'far al-Tayyar says, لا نسجد إلا لله. All of a sudden, from people who were bowing to the rocks and dirts, they didn't give, you know, they didn't budge in except to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is one form of a transformation. The other form of a transformation, brothers and sisters, when Quran came and liberated, you know, liberated them and set them free, set us free as Muslims from superstitions, set our minds and our brains free. Look at Quran. Always tell their people, the people, to go and search, learn, see, look at the natural science. Then compare. Don't you see that there is a correlation between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and nature? Wouldn't it the nature sign, assign you to a great Lord? The ayah says, قُلْ انظُرُوا مَاذَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ Or in another ayah, قُلْ سِيرُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ Walk! قُلْ سِيرُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ فَانظُرُوا كَيْفَ بَدَأَ الْخَلْقِ It's through search. Through research and study, you will find out how this universe has been created. Nowadays, they tell you that this universe has been created through what? What was the event? The Big Bang Theory. Through studying, you know, the, the nature, the nature of this earth and nature of this universe, they got to this conclusion that this universe was created at one moment, 14 billion years ago. You know, I have probably a year or two years ago, I gave a full lecture about the Big Bang Theory and how does it prove the eminence, the magnificence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Before, the atheist, the materialistic people, would say that this universe was a primordial. Didn't have a beginning, nor it will have an end. This is like a steady state of existence. Why they would say this? Because the minute that they say, that this universe has a beginning, the question comes, how did it have a beginning? Who has created it? From nothingness to something, this is a you know, huge difference. You can change the existence from one aspect, one state to another state. You know, energy changes from thermal to mechanical, mechanical, electrical, things like that, but cannot be created. The law of physics says that energy cannot be created nor get destroyed, right? This is the first law of thermodynamics. So if something gets created from the very beginning, no matter how far away, the minute that gets created, who has created it? There must be some entity has created this. Now the scientists tell you that. You know, this universe has been created based on the Big Bang Theory. Therefore, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, read, understand. You don't see any religion who invoke his people, his followers to study and read and acquire knowledge as much as Islam. In fact, he makes it, you know, equal. Being a faithful with being knowledgeable. You fear God because you have knowledge. If you don't have knowledge, you don't fear God. <inaudible> Only those who fear God are those who have knowledge. Look at other religions. Which religion invoke people and, you know, entice people to study? Look at Christianity. Christianity 600 years ago, six, seven centuries ago, they were persecuting the scientists. They would kill them. They would burn them to death. Any scientist who would come with a new idea, he would be, you know, condemned to death. But Islam... Invoke people to study more. In fact, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, out of his mercy, has granted Quran to promote our level of knowledge. In fact, have dignified us with the holy Quran. Don't we say that the Quran is the miracle of Allah? Is the miracle of our great prophet? You see, the Almighty God, when He descended the Qur'an to maximize the role of mind and brain and intellectuality. How? Look at the previous nations. The previous nations before Islam, 
For example, Christianity and Judaism and before them. Every prophet used to have a miracle, right? Ibrahim had a miracle. Musa alayhi salam had a miracle. Isa alayhi salam had a miracle. What were the, those miracles? Musa, for example, had a stick, a staff. He would grab this staff, hit it on the stone. It changed to become what? A giant serpent will eat everything out. Once he take his hand back again to his pocket, this serpent becomes a stick, right? Isa alayhi salam, what he used to do? He would grab pieces of clay, get them together, blow in them, and they become bird. وَآيَةً لِبَنِي إِسْرَائِيلِ إِنِّي أَخْلُقُ لَكُمْ مِنَ الطَّيْرِ كَهَيْءَ مِنَ الطِّينِ كَهَيْءَةِ الطَّيْرِ فَأَنْفُخُ فِيهِ فَيَكُونُ طَيْرًا بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ وَأُبْرِئُ الْأَكْمَهَ وَالْأَبْرَصَ بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ وَأُحْيِي الْمَوْتَى بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ I blow in this bird and it becomes, you know, becomes a bird and it flies. Those miracles were straightforward. That everyone will see them, understand them. Irregard of his education, irregard of his level of understanding. Whether you are a farmer, a worker, or a dentist, or a doctor, or a philosopher, you see these miracles, you understand them. Something straightforward. Doesn't require too much, you know, thinking and meditation. You know, we say it's not a nuclear chemistry. One plus one is two. Those miracles were obvious to everyone. Simple. People will see them. They believe that this prophet was, you know, is a messenger of God. He came from God. Quran is a miracle of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But unlike other miracles, those miracles were one on one, one on one miracles. That's what we call them, right? But Quran is different. Quran, you have to think. You have to ponder. You have to meditate. You have to think and study, then you recognize that this book is different from other books. What does that entail? It entails that we have to use the brain. You have to use our intellect. And this is the difference, brothers and sisters, between a human being and animal. The animal does not use his brain. While a human being, you know, maximizes the role of his brain. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala introduced the Holy Quran as the eternal miracle. For the Prophet is to maximize the role of a human being. In fact, has dignified a human being through the role of Quran. Sallu ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. This is the second kind of liberation. And the third kind of brothers and sisters that Quran has liberated people is liberating them from their commanding soul from the chains of soul from the lust and desires the ayah says you know we always think of an external enemy there is an external enemy you know will come and raid and kill and destroy we have to be protected but there is an internal enemy within that is more dangerous than the external enemy and that is نفس الأمارة وما أبرئ نفسي إن النفس لأمارة بالسوء Each nafs, each spirit, each soul has this commanding soul within itself that always pushes it toward lust, toward desires to be enslaved by desires and lust Quran came to liberate us from that to give us resistance to give us immunity in face of lust and desires one day the muslims were coming from a bloody battle they got to medina dead tired they lost you know big loss but they were victorious when they came the prophet peace be upon him told them you know qadimtum min al jihad al asghar wa alaykum bil jihad al akbar you just came back from a minute jihad. Now there is a grand jihad is waiting for them. They were terrified. Ya Rasulullah, we just got back from the, this bloody battle. Which battle is waiting for us? He said, the great jihad. What is this a great jihad? Qal jihadun nafsul ammar. You have a commanding soul inside. 
You have to be immune. You have to protect yourself against this commanding soul. How did Islam liberate us from this commanding soul? I will give you an example. Prior to Islam, the entire Arabian Peninsula, not only Arabian Peninsula, in fact everywhere, everybody, every community, every society were addicted to wines. Nowadays, in the Christianity doctrines, what do they consider wine? They consider wine as the blood of Jesus, right? They give you the bread as the flesh of Jesus and wine, the red wine or white wine, I don't know which one. You know, alhamdulillah, I've never been any church. So they give you the red wine, they tell you this is the blood of Jesus. How much addiction they got before Islam, the entire peninsula was also addicted to wine, to drinking intoxicating, you know, agents. Everyone, every household, every family, there was only one family. There was only one family that stayed immune. One of them was Ja'far ibn Abi Talib. That tonight we are commemorating the grandsons of Ja'far ibn Abi Talib. One day, you know, he was asked, he said that I haven't done three things. Adultery, bowing to the idols, and drinking wines. Three things that I did not commit while before Islam. That was Ja'far ibn Abi Talib. Now, in Arabian Peninsula, drinking wine was rampant everywhere. In fact, someone's name Tajr, which means trader, entrepreneur. When they say Tajr, it means that someone who sells alcohol, like a winery. This person's name is, you know, Tajr. They call him Tajr. People would drink everywhere, anytime. Even Quran came to tell them that at least during your prayers, do not drink Alcohol. Do not be under the influence of alcohol. Intoxicated. Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu. La taqrabu salat wa antum sukara. Don't perform your prayers while you are, you know, intoxicated. Be careful. Be careful. Until it reached the one day that this ayah descended. That alcohol is completely, wine is completely forbidden. The ayah says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, innama al-khamru wal-maysiru wal-ansabu wal-azlam, ritsun min amal al-shaytan, fajtanibuh. This is filth of shaytan. Shun it. Abandon it. Be away from it. In one night, this nation that was addictive to wines and intoxicating agents, all of a sudden they become a nation fighting wines. Fighting wines drinking and alcohol completely disappeared completely from the face of the cities you would not see them this is how islam this is how quran you know liberated the soul from their desires from their lust on the contrary look at other nations the nation that calls themselves they are the leaders of the free people they don't call this land the land of the free, the land of the conscientious people, the land of, you know, liberating or liberty, whatever you want to call it. Look at this country here. In 1920, there was a movement called Temperance Movement. Check it. Google it when you go back home. Google search this movement. It's called Temperance Movement. That was spearheaded by the religious domination to reduce denominations, to reduce the level, the level of wine and alcoholic consumptions. Reduce it at least, not to be so much. They used to make laws, you know, they forced the government to make laws to forbid the wineries, for example, and a transport of alcohol. Only certain aspect of it under the name of temperance movement. They started from 1920 or 1918, around that time. They spent more than $65 million for advertisement, lobbying the Congress, lobbying the government, talking to people. They have produced more than 900 million pages. 900 million pages of advertisement, documents, studies, statistics, pamphlets, brochures. 
just to tell people how dangerous alcohol consumption is. They have spent more than $65 million. But after, 30, after 13 years, when they did this one, you know, because the Constitution say people are free, they can do whatever they want. So they have introduced an amendment. This amendment was the 18th amendment to the Constitution of the United States, forbidding the cons consumption of alcohol in certain areas and usage of alcohol in certain areas, not completely. That was in 19. 20. After 13 years, they failed. 200 people were killed. More than $3 million in fines and, you know, and other problems that have caused, have lost, the government has lost more than $3 million. $3 million. 200 people were killed. Eventually, in 1933, they revoked that amendment. They introduced another amendment, amendment number 21, abolishing amendment 18. They couldn't resist. Why? Because they were people, you know, who have found the loopholes, how they come up, you know, in selling alcohols. They say you cannot sell alcohol. The salons say, okay. Pubs say, okay, no problem. You know, we won't sell alcohol. But we will give a free lunch. You would like to have a free lunch? Entitled, you will take alcohol with it. And this is the price of it. They sold a free lunch. You know, happy, you, know, you know the term happy hour? Where did this happy hour have started? You know, back from 1920, from that time. You know, using different loopholes, different mechanisms to overcome and bypass this law. In fact, what they did do, they liberated a human being, yes, from a despot, from a dictator, but they couldn't liberate the human being from his own commanding soul, from his own desires, still being enslaved by his desires. But Quran was able to transform, to trans transcend one nation that was addictive to all kind of bad things, to a nation that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls upon them, كُنْتُمْ خَيْرَ أُمَّةٍ أُخْرِجَتْ لِلنَّاسِ تَأْمُرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَتَنْهَوْنَ عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ This is the nation. And this was transformed by the Holy Quran. But how we should deal with Quran? We said that Quran is the cause of a cure, healing, guidance, enlightenment, everything. Is it by recitation? Just I go and read the Quran? Or I just keep it, you know, an honoring book during my marriage ceremonies. At the aqd time, I make it part of the dowry. When I make the, you know, aqd nikah, I make the dowry is one kitab Allah and 1500 of gold coins and things like that. Or when I want to travel and take a trip, I go and kiss the Quran and go underneath the Quran. Or during the Fatha, the memorial service, I just recite some Quran. Is that what, is it, what it is? Or only recitation, for example, during the month of Ramadan? Or throughout the year? Is it, is, it, is it this way? When we say healing, what do we mean by saying healing? You get sick. You catch cold. You go to the doctor. The doctor writes you a prescription. Tells you, here it is. I wrote you antibiotics. You grab this antibiotics and you say 100 times, ag argumenting, 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 erythromycin, erythromycin, erythromycin. Would you be cured? When, you be cu you know, when do you become cured? When you take this prescription, give it to the pharmacist, it gives you the medicine, you drink this medicine. You take this medicine, then you will be cured. Meaning that you have to adopt it. We have to make it a constitution that we work by Quran. You see Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. On his last minute, on his last hour in this life, when he gathered his family, he says, Allah, Allah, fil Quran. Be careful. Hold Quran. But how? By recitation? He didn't say recitation. He says, Allah, Allah, bil Quran, la yasbiqkum bil amali bihi ghayrukum. Don't allow others to adopt Quran, to make it their constitution. They follow it, they exemplify it, while you don't. It's amal bil Quran, it's not just recitation. If it's only recitation and memorialization of that, we memorize 
the Quran. Now the ISIS group, mashallah, all of them, they memorize the Quran. Hajjaj ibn Yusuf al thaqafi you know Hajjaj? Hajjaj in one era, within three months, have killed 50,000 followers of Ahlul Bayt, alayhum as 50,000 followers. <laughs> Al-Hajjaj, in his biography, it says that he used to memorize the entire Quran. The entire Quran. Was very shrewd. No one can beat him on memorization of Quran. This is how he was. It is not by Quran, just by reciting Quran. You know, in Ramadan, I recite, mashallah, how many times? Twice, three times, and I check with my brother, with my wife, where are you? You're in chapter 19. Oh, I am chapter 15. You're, mashallah, stronger than me. You have more energy. Well, I will catch up with you. I always look at the final page when I'm going to finish, you know, the 10th page of the, of the juzu. This is not what is required, the brothers and sisters. Whenever we adopt Quran, you saw Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, الَّذِينَ يَتْلُونَ الْكِتَابَ حَقَّ تِلَاوَتِهِ Tilawa when I recite it with meditation, when I, you know, take a lesson from that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you know, I read four times, five times, six times of Quran, but absent-mindedly. It doesn't help me. A single ayah. If I stop at one single ayah, and I recite that ayah, and I understand that ayah, and adopt it, I will be saved from Jahannam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا يَغْتَبْ بَعْضُكُمْ بَعْضًا If I read Quran 120 times and I read this ayah and pass, but I don't commit myself not to do backbiting. You know, what points Quran does to me? Nothing. Would not help me at all. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will hold me liable tomorrow. In the day of judgment, you said that you have recited this ayah 120 times, you still were doing, you know, backbiting. You never learned your lessons. While in the hadith, in the narration, sa says that whenever the ayat were revealed to the Prophet, the Prophet, peace be upon him, will take 10 ayah. Each time, 10 ayah will give it to the Sahab, to the companions. Ask them to memorize it first and adopt it. Think about it. Meditate. يتدبرون. أفلا يتدبرون القرآن. It says that كان الصحابة يأخذون من رسول الله عشر آيات. فلا يأخذون في العشر الأخرى حتى يعلموا ما في هذه من العلم والعمل. They would adopt it. They make it their own constitution. Then the Prophet would give them, you know, another ten ayah. Unfortunately, sometimes. يعني الحمد لله إن شاء الله it's not here but I have seen it back in the Muslim country sometimes in the holiest place in the holiest town in the holiest city you go to a memorial service you see the Quran is getting recited and people are talking among themselves and laughing and chatting Allah سبحانه وتعالى says فإذا قرأ القرآن فاستمعوا له وأنصتوا listen why لعلكم ترحمون one source of a blessing one source of mercy is that I listen to Quran. Listen for what reason? So I act upon it. So I adopt it. So I learn from it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Holy Quran says, وَلَا تَرْكَنُوا إِلَى الَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا فَتَمَسَّكُمُ النَّارِ If there is a zalim, if there is an oppressor, you cannot be quiet. If you be quiet, you become like him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will put us in the same level of that zalim on the times of Imam Hussein, how many people have recognized this? That Yazid is zalim. Yazid is an oppressor. That they have to go with Imam Hussein alayhi salam. People of Medina, so many of the companions of the Prophet, companions of Emir al muminin alayhi salam, even family members, how many have left? With Imam Hussein Sayyid al Shuhada to Karbala. From Bani Hashim themselves, how many? The history says they were only three families. Families of Ali ibn Abi Talib, alayhi salam, family of Aqil, and family of Ja'far. That's it. The entire Medina had only those three families. Even, even the family of Abbas, the uncle of the Prophet, they didn't go out. Why? Because they were oblivious about Quran. They were not listening to Quran. Among them were those two warriors, two noblemen, 
جعفر بن أبي طالب عليه السلام عن عقيل بن أبي طالب جعفر left مكة toward حبشة stayed in حبشة for seven years he returned to مدينة in the year of seventh of Hijrah on the battle of Mu'tah he was martyred he left two children Abdullah and Muhammad that had a great impact on the Prophet for the first time Muslims see that the Prophet is weeping and crying he goes to his home he holds his two children he says bring me two of my nephews Ibn Akhi Walada Akhi you know Abdullah and Muhammad are my nephews are my children he grabs Abdullah and Muhammad he hold them you know and he says Allahumma khluf Ja'faran fi ahlihi wa barik li Abdullah fi safqatihi Abdullah ibn Ja'far became a wealthy man due to the prayer of the Prophet peace be upon him Allah you know the Prophet has asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bestow blessing on his wealth and money you know he he took Abdullah for custody for a while then Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam took Abdullah for custody when Abdullah grew up he made Zainab to be his wife but told him ya Abdullah Zainab has a role Zainab has a responsibility at what point at one point she has to follow her brother Hussein would you object to that he said no I will not object to that Zainab can go wherever she would go on the day when Imam Hussein was leaving Abdullah came to him Ya Hussein Ya Aba Abdullah where are you leaving where are you taking the children and the wives and the sisters he says Sha Allah and Yarahun Sabaya Abdullah was paralyzed at the time he had impairment he asked his sons Aun Muhammad to go and follow the footstep of their uncle to be with their mother in the battles of Ashura a few days ago I said a few nights ago I said that Zainab al-Kubra had a managerial role she would you know direct the, the battle she would know which warrior would go outside whom would go and fight you know and fight when they would bring the dead the martyr she was the first one to receive them to hold them when was the role the time of children of Abi Talib started the first one was Ali al-Akbar afterward Zainab went and called upon her children Aun and Muhammad they came Aun was a young strong man with a bravery he went in the battle reciting this poetic epic he says in tunkuruni fa'ana ibn ja'fari shahidu sidqin fil jinani azhari yatiru fiha bi janahin akhdari kafa bi hada sharafan fil mahshari he was killing you know from left and right more than 21 of the infidels he killed until he was martyred abdullah ibn qatnat al tamimi hits him and he falls on the ground and says Adrikni ya ammah assalamu alayka ya aba abdullah Imam Hussein came and take him took him to the tent afterward his brother Muhammad also falls at the hand of Amir ibn Nahshal al-Tamimi now those two martyrs those two young people are brought to the tent but where is their mother Zainab that used to receive everyone Ali al-Akbar, Qasim, Abdullah, Uthman everyone of the household of the Prophet she was the first recipient to receive them but this time Zainab sitting in the tent she would not come out why Zainab those are your children no I am shy from Hussein I am ashamed from Hussein because I have only two sons I wish I had more that I would sacrifice him in the way of Abi Abdullah al Hussein لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم إنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون السلام عليك يا أبا عبد الله وعلى الأرواح التي حلت بفنائك وأناخت برحلك عليكم مني جميعا سلام الله أبدا ما بقيت وبقي الليل والنهار 
ولا جعله الله آخر العهد مني لزيارتكم Everyone. السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين ورحمة الله وبركاته